Thank you everyone for joining the Accelerating Machine Learning with OpenCL webinar. During this webinar, members of the OpenCL Working Group at Kronos will share the very latest updates to OpenCL extensions and ecosystem that directly benefit machine learning workflows. First, a couple of housekeeping items. If you have any questions during this presentation, please ask them using the Q&A feature located on your Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. We are recording this webinar and we'll share the link along with the slides when they are available. At the end of the session, please complete the short, short survey form to help us better design future events. With that, let's get the webinar started with Neil Trevet, president of the Kronos Group. Neil? Thanks, Jeff. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Neil, Neil Trevet. Uh, I work for uh, NVIDIA and I'm a chair of the OpenCL Working Group. And I'm happy that we have some great panelists here with us today. Um, uh, Roy from Intel, uh, Balaji from Qualcomm, who are both going to present, and Kevin uh, from ARM, who's going to join uh, the Q&A uh, session. Uh, before we start with those presentations, I wanted to give a very quick overview of um, the uh, new uh, Kronos Machine Learning Forum and invite you all uh, to join. So if you are not familiar with Kronos, we are an open standards organization. We have 200 members. We create uh, a multiple open standards, such as uh, OpenCL, Sickle, Vulkan, and, and others. And everyone is welcome to join. And we have multiple compute acceleration standards, higher level uh, standards such as Sickle, along with OpenVX, a graph-based vision and inferencing acceleration library and low level APIs such as Vulkan and OpenCL. But of course, here today, we are focused on o OpenCL. OpenCL is already widely used in the inference, inferencing market and industry, um, both in compilers you know, such as uh, TVM um, and uh, Glow for PyTorch. Um, the compilers will import trained networks uh, do graph level optimizations, but in the end, they need to compose down into primitive instructions that can be uh, accelerated on runtimes. And pretty much all of the compilers out there today uh, will include uh, OpenCL amongst their runtime output options. Also, a lot of the uh, machine learning uh, libraries and frameworks uh, out there have OpenCL uh, acceleration, uh, both in the desktop and uh, the mobile and embedded uh, spaces. So OpenCL is already being widely used. But the OpenCL Working Group is uh, always developing an extension pipeline. And if you do a quick scan through the recent extensions that we have shipped since last year's iWockle and some of the uh, EXT and vendor extensions that are in the pipeline and candidates for becoming Kronos extensions, you know, quite a large proportion proportion of them, the ones that I've uh, ringed in red here, um, have um, relevance um, to uh, machine learning and inferencing uh, acceleration. So this whole domain of machine learning is becoming you know, more and more important to the direction in which OpenCL uh, evolves. And that's why we're, we're so interested and uh, uh, keen to get uh, developer input as to what direction this evolution should take. And that's why we have created the Kronos Machine Learning Forum. Uh, it's intended to be uh, open to everyone. You don't need to be a Kronos member. Uh, it's free. Uh, there's no NDA and no IP commitments. Uh, it's intended to be a, a very accessible open forum uh, to foster an ongoing communication uh, between the Kronos community and the machine learning hardware and software communities. So Kronos can be responsive to those communities for, with all of its APIs, not, not just OpenCL and Vulkan, but no, all of the APIs that we do that are relevant to that community. We're very interested to get use cases and requirements, and we will be able to present uh, updates and roadmap information uh, to the wider uh, community. Uh, we, we actually have started uh, uh, with several meetings. Uh, we held a, a one-off summit back in October with a um, feedback and response session in January. Uh, just last week, we did a Vulcan ML webinar similar to this one, but focused obviously on Vulcan. Now we're here at the OpenCL 
webinar and we are going to be scheduling more around sickle and openvx and uh, other topics but the uh, these are public webinars but former members now will have access to um, the uh, um, an internal forum um, email list so we'll be able to have in internal discussions inside the forum um, much more two-way conversations um, as well as these more outreach uh, based uh, webinars so we hope that's of interest to you all the information that you need uh, to join is, is here at this link and we will be um, a, uh, posting these slides so we get the link directly uh, from there so yes please do consider joining so without further ado let me introduce you to uh, ray uh, from intel who's gonna has a good case study around using uh, opencl for uh, uh, machine learning acceleration o over to you roy Hi, thank you for the introduction. So as mentioned, I worked on a team where we were comparing OpenCL and in particular, we actually decided to look into assembly on Intel's GPUs to, to see what the pros and cons are of these implementations. So as a, an introduction, so I'm, an AI algorithm engineer at Intel working on 1DNN. I'm experienced in both CPU and GPU optimization. I actually started in CPU optimization back in 2015. And I, I moved into 1DNN in 2019. I've been focusing on optimizing for machine learning. And I originally started out with CPU optimizations, but later switched to GPU optimizations in 2020. So as a kind of a high level agenda, I'm going to introduce what 1DNN is, um, a little bit about the architecture that we are optimizing for to try and explain the, the problem space a little bit, and hopefully explain some of the issues that we have encountered and why we actually looked into doing this. And then uh, basically the, the results of our, our comparison and what we, what we decided to do because of this. So, so to begin with, 1DNN is a, an open source library for optimizing deep learning workloads. Um, the focus of my team is, of course, optimizing for Intel hardware. We do provide interfaces to some other hardware, like we provide an interface that basically dispatch, dis, dispatches to CUDNN. And we, we're open to adding other interfaces to, to more hardware in the library. Um, we, we focus on heterogeneous computing. Um, main focus so far has been on CPU and GPU. There's been work on both ARM CPUs, Intel CPUs, and then our, our GPUs. And we provide cross-platform support and should work on Linux, Windows, Mac. For, for our requirements, we basically want at runtime to pick an op optimal implementation based on the problem and hardware that you are actually going to be running a problem on. To, to do this, we, we kind of use a, a just-in-time compilation-based architecture. And within this, we, we support multiple data types like int8, f16, bfloat16, floats. And we also support multiple data formats. We, we generally support kind of two kinds of data formats. One is a basically the, an interchange format. So like we'll do channel last on, on say convolutions to avoid reorders because those can be expensive. And then we also support a format that is kind of optimized for the, the computation. So if you can leave the, just, just call different functions within the library and stay in the the optimized format, you'll get somewhat better performance. Not, not every use case can take advantage of that, though. So as part of this, we are optimizing for our GPUs, both upcoming and we also support currently existing integrated GPUs. So the, the high-level architecture of 
the essentially upcoming GPUs as we divide the GPU up into XE cores. It's kind of standard standard GPU architecture. So each core is composed of what's called a, a vector engine and a, a matrix engine. The, these essentially perform the the main computation as part of our our work. And then there's a number of shared resources on the core, like cache or the shared local memory, and then a, a unit for loading and storing from from global memory. And the in particular, the XE matrix extension, it provides access to what, what are basically some instructions that do matrix multiplication. The, these particular instructions are called DPASS and DPASS W. They, they, provide, they perform matrix multiplication, although there are some, some restrictions on the format of the data that is put to them. Essentially, they have to use a, a certain packed format based on, on data size. So as part of our, our work, we, in particular, I'm focusing on convolutions in this talk. And so we end up running into some, a lot of different optimizations that we may want to consider. So we, we need to reorder the data potentially from the generic format or using the optimized format into say a format that's optimal for this instruction. As part of that, say, data reorder, we might just be using the L1 cache to and reorder on each vector engine. Or it's also possible that we try and distribute a reorder if we have data reuse in, within SLM or if a machine doesn't actually have L1 cache. And along with a, a number of other optimizations, they, they don't always mesh nicely because the way you divide, divide up the problem can change quite significantly based on what, which optimization you're considering. And so because of this, we actually looked into implementing on essentially ResNet 58. Here is as good of a version as we can get for both OpenCL and just a like hand optimized assembly to, to make a comparison to see, make sure that everything is, is working well. So for the, the Intel, or for the, the OpenCL version, we required on a, a number of features. So we use subgroups to, to take advantage of this core's architecture. Um, we, we also use, because we need to support, say, bfloat 16 data types. So we use some extensions related to that. And we use various compiler built-ins that give us access to the XMX unit, along with other stuff that is just available at, on the Intel hardware. Um, there are some plans to try and enable simpler access to this. Um, I believe there are some extensions that are being requested to add to SPRV and to, to Sickle. And there are some plans that are work in progress for trying to get a, um, a OpenCL extension similar to how we have for bflow 16. So for the assembly side of things, we actually have a essentially a C++ library for assembly generation on Intel GPUs. It it's, supports both doing things ahead of time or just in time. And it, it's based on, there's a, a library called xbiac that essentially does the same thing for x86 instruction sets where you can, you can basically call a, a function and it will emit the corresponding binary associated with the actual assembled instruction. And you can use that to implement some, and, and a, essentially a just-in-time assembler. And that is actually what we did for CPU side and on optimization there. And for the results, I mean, so we, we first had our, our OpenCL implementation, went, Went in, we made our optimized engine implementation. We actually saw a fairly significant speed up in a lot of cases. But then we we went back and we tried to make sure our OpenCL implementation actually had all the, the same optimizations we were able to, to get in the engine optimized version. And so we, we were able to, to do that. We were able to backport optimizations. As a, as a result, we got 
fairly significant speed ups on OpenCL versions, on the OpenCL version. Although in, in general, the, the assembled version still went a little bit faster. Um, we, we then went through and actually did a like binary analysis of what was going on in the OpenCL versus the NGen. And there, there were really only a couple of things. First, OpenCL's implementation was emitting shorter read instructions. And second, there were some conditions that were emitting extra instructions in the OpenCL C implementation. But neither of those issues are really fundamental to OpenCL with either work with, say, Intel's compiler team or modifying our implementation to a little bit, we should be able to get rid of those. And so kind of our, our takeaway was in OpenCL, we can get essentially equivalent performance. There, there's nothing that's really stopping us from getting good performance in OpenCL if we use extensions. Um, assembly is, of course, poor for productivity. There, no surprises there. But it, it was useful for revealing gaps in our implementation. It was definitely, it can be helpful to look at like low level, what does the hardware support? And then take the, the learning from that and be like, oh, well, yeah, I'm not generating quite the right instructions in the OpenCL and I need to modify things in X way so that I get the, the, the correct instructions emitted. The other thing that we ran into is because we're using this just-in-time compiled architecture, OpenCLC is just very slow. That's one of the reasons we were looking into this, because to do because the compiler was generally taking around half a second to to compile, which is a, a large latency. If you are saying, I want this to create this primitive to execute a a specific problem. And then I need to, to wait half a second before the, the optimized version is ready. Um, and when we were just using the assembly-based version, it, things went much faster. It was, it, you're basically doing like one pass over the, the data, well, over the binary that you're generating, run, run significantly faster. Um, we also investigated some other methods that are available for improving performance, like SPIRV allows, um, what is it? You can put constants and then do optimization and not have to actually parse the OpenCLC. We, we looked into that. We were seeing basically a performance improvement of about 3x, but that still isn't quite enough for our purposes. And finally, for, for both implementations, we, we were running into issues where we'd have conflicting optimizations. We're, we're supporting different data types, different formats or different data formats, different architectures, and then all the problem shape specific optimizations that we might want to consider. So it was challenging, at least with an OpenCL, to, to determine like when we would modify things just a little bit and we might break a compiler optimization heuristic. That, that hit us a few times. It wasn't generally the biggest issue. And the other issue is it was really hard to combine different optimizations because they could lead to fairly significant changes in the, the approach to the problem. So our, our eventual solution, we, we decided that we didn't really like either of these solutions. First, OpenCL compile time was kind of a, a non-starter for OpenCL and just doing raw assembly was, it just would be way too, too much work. And so we actually switched to using what, what we called an assembly generator. So we created a, a custom IR targeted for our spe specific use case. We, we loosely ba base this on Halide. And then what we do is we, we have the initial IR and we specify optimi optimization transforms to, to the problem. So in this case, code generation is currently significantly faster. It's, things are still taking around 50 milliseconds. Um, and we, we should be able to, to improve that further. 
and we we do plan to to do that because 50 milliseconds is still slower than we would like to see and the the other big thing that came from this is that we are able to compose our optimizations much more effectively so before we'd have multiple implementations because say trait x y and z work you need trait x y and z to work together and then trait x y and z2 and trait x1 y z2 and we basically had a kind of a proliferation of implementations going on by by doing this just specify the the particular transform we can avoid that proliferation of implementations are there any questions Cool. Thank you, Roy. So we're going to take questions in the um, Q and A session at, at the end. So okay. Yeah. So uh, invite Balaji to uh, present next. Do you want to grab the screen, Balaji? Hi. Uh, quick check, Neil. Uh, share looks good. And look, looks good. All right, thanks. <laughs> I'll take it from here. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Balaji Kalidas. Uh, I work on uh, OpenCL and uh, uh, GPU machine learning acceleration at Qualcomm. And I'll be talking about uh, some of the uh, extensions and, and features uh, that Qualcomm supports uh, that help accelerate machine learning. Although this presentation will have a Qualcomm uh, specific flavor, uh, a lot of the concepts uh, and the extensions uh, will uh, apply to all uh, mobile vendors. All right. So uh, the, the first uh, takeaway is that uh, machine learning on mobile uh, is rapidly growing. Um, and and uh, through our direct uh, interactions, we have observed a large uh, increase in the number of use cases and uh, there's also been a increase in the number of uh, uh, references in research literature. Um, now on a mobile SOC, you'll typically have a uh, choice of a number of accelerators, including some custom uh, 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 you know, DNN accelerators. However, GPUs still remain a popular option. And I think a big uh, reason for that popularity is the fact that GPUs are, are supported through industry standard APIs such as OpenCL and, and developers uh, like that uh, portability. Uh, there are a large number of uh, machine learning frameworks and compilers uh, that use OpenCL uh, and uh, some of them are TVM, uh, TFLite, Snappy, MNN, uh, Mace, and Paddleite. Uh, and there are actually more. Um, so right now, what we've seen in terms of the use cases, the majority are focus on inference, but we do see edge training as uh, an important emerging area. Uh, some of the things that are a little bit different on mobile as opposed to desktop or cloud, as far as machine learning are concerned, is that first of all, power consumption is a very key consideration. Uh, other things to look at are uh, low latency dispatch. Uh, you want to get your data in and out of your machine learning model with uh, minimum delays. So low latency dispatch of your machine learning uh, commands as well as synchronization and especially synchronization with other uh, blocks on your SOC. So for example, when you're working on, on mobile, uh, you, you might be streaming data from, say, the camera to a machine learning model running on the GPU and then streaming the output somewhere else. Uh, so to make that all go efficiently, uh, you know, it's important to have hooks in your uh, OpenCL implementation. Uh, so some of the uh, features that make this possible are uh, zero copy import and export of data and uh, you know, we support features uh, like import and export of Android uh, hardware buffer and DMA buff that make this possible. Uh, another important uh, uh, consideration is is reducing your memory footprint. Obviously, a mem uh, on a re memory restricted environment on mobile. Uh, it turns out that with machine learning, uh, it, it, your 
your models can get quite large. Uh, they can be a large number of layers with a large number of tensors uh, uh, for all the activations and the weights. However, you don't really need all the layers to be resident in memory at any given point in time. Um, so, uh, you know, one thing that you could do is to try and reuse the memory uh, for tensors as much as possible. And a little bit later in the presentation, I'll talk to some uh, extensions uh, that make it possible. All right. Um, so first extension I'm going to talk about is CLQCOM MLOps. Uh, this is a Qualcomm vendor extension for accelerating uh, machine learning on our GPUs at the uh, op level. Uh, so CLQCOM MLOps has been sh uh, shipping from uh, Snapdragon 888 on uh, and uh, uh, on the uh, successor uh, SOC, which is the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1, we also added support for uh, edge training. Uh, another thing that we were able to do is we were able to integrate this extension with TVM BYOC, and uh, that effort went very well. And uh, we have a poster on that at iWalkle 2022. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, uh, please do so. It, it uh, is a very interesting result. Uh, some features of this extension are as much as possible, it uses existing OpenCL uh, constructs, uh, command queues, events, uh, buffers. Uh, there are a few new objects such as ops and tensors, but for the most part, it fits in very nicely with the existing OpenCL API. And that was uh, in fact, one of the reasons why the uh, TVM integration went so well. Uh, it is fully interoperable with other OpenCL kernels, and the idea is that uh, we accelerate, as the vendor, accelerate a few key meta commands. Uh, for everything else, you can write OpenCL kernels and uh, run them, you know, dispatch them uh, in line to the same queue or synchronize them with events. Uh, but uh, long story short, you should be able to seamlessly mix and match uh, your custom operations for which you write OpenCL kernels with the uh, vendor accelerated uh, operations which we provide. Uh, the samples and documentation for this extension are available from uh, the uh, Qualcomm Developer Network website. I posted the link here. Uh, a little more detail about how we do training uh, with uh, the CLQCOM MLOps extension. Uh, first of all, what is the motivation for being able to do edge training? Uh, the primary use cases are transfer learning, personalization, and federated learning. Uh, and, and these are cases where you might you know, want to tune your model a little bit based on uh, the data that's available at the edge or for you know, uh, uh, privacy reasons, for instance, uh, the data can't leave the edge. So, so you might you know, want to convert that data into gradients uh, uh, before you send it to the cloud. Uh, the main limiting factor for, for training at the edge is memory footprint. Uh, it, it, the reason is all of the weights and, and uh, all of the gradients, all of the activations, they have to be maintained in memory for training. And even for a relatively uh, small model like mobile net, the total footprint uh, we've estimated to be around two gigabytes, uh, which is too large. So one approach that we've taken uh, to solve this problem is to use what we call the tensor batch one approach. Uh, in traditional training, you would use batch sizes of uh, maybe 32 is a typical batch size, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. Uh, but what we've done is come up with a modified approach where you would keep your tensor batch size as one, and then you would essentially do a number of uh, uh, you know, forward and backward passes until you've gone through the batch, and we call that, um, uh, you know, a, a mini batch. But at the end of that mini batch, essentially, uh, you would uh, take all the gradients that you'd accumulated, and then you would apply them. And mathematically, this gives you uh, uh, the same results uh, as if you, you were training with a larger batch size. Now, uh, there is a challenge if you have batch normalization layers in your model. Uh, if you did have that, then you would freeze your batch norm statistics. Uh, for the use cases that are interest to us, such as uh, transfer learning, 
uh, we find that this is not a challenge since you really, in most cases, you would not need to change your batch num statistics, but if you're just you know picking one or two layers to go uh, tweak a bit based on data at the edge, I think this this approach would work uh, just fine. Uh, now uh, we understand that there will be a need for additional approaches to training going forward, um, so we are looking into that, and we will be uh, adding those uh, approaches in uh, future uh, revisions of this extension. All right. I will turn my attention a little bit to some of the other uh, pure OpenCL extensions that, that we have that uh, also help accelerate machine learning. Uh, we have a vendor extension for 8-bit.product. Uh, this one uh, does the 8-bit.product with sat saturating accumulate, and it can uh, give a significant uh, performance benefit uh, when uh, implementing 8-bit quantized uh, DNNs. Uh, we also have an interesting extension that we call uh, CLQCOM recordable queues. Uh, the idea with, with recordable queues is uh, it, it, instead of uh, dispatching your uh, kernels right away using NQ and range kernel, you would send them to a special queue, which is a recording queue. And you are then able to record a sequence of NQ and range kernel commands. And uh, once the recording is, is complete, you close it. And now you can replay the recording uh, with a special uh, dispatch call. Uh, the advantage of using this extension is when you're dispatching a large number of uh, kernels back to back, uh, this can give significant improvements in CPU power consumption and in dispatch latency. Uh, so one of the uh, obvious benefits that we've seen is, is really in helping to drive a very high uh, GPU utilization as compared to not uh, using this extension and, and queuing the kernels directly. Uh, and as I mentioned, for streaming mode machine learning use cases, where you say streaming video through a machine learning model, uh, uh, dispatch latency is really important. Uh, and, and so uh, this extension really makes a big difference there. Uh, some of the other extensions and uh, that help uh, with machine learning are, are obviously zero copy. Uh, that's, uh, you know, the DMA, AHB import, and we have a few others. Uh, subgroup operations, uh, although I, I think in some ways they can be considered a core part of the spec now, uh, they also tend to be extremely useful for machine learning. Uh, and, and I've also added subgroup size uh, control here. Uh, and, and all of those are, are available uh, as Qualcomm extensions. Uh, there are also a number of extensions uh, that are uh, uh, either uh, shipping uh, from Kronos, either or provisionally released or on the Kronos roadmap. And, uh, you know, this basically is a Qualcomm uh, interest uh, page where these are the extensions that uh, we would be interested in supporting going forward. Uh, and all of these uh, are helpful uh, for machine learning. Uh, the CLKHI and TJ dot product uh, that uh, in, in some ways is a uh, superset of the capabilities of the uh, uh, Qualcomm dot product extension. Uh, we will be uh, looking to supporting that going forward. The command buffer recording and replay, uh, again, very much the same benefits as our recordable queues extension. Uh, uh, perhaps in some ways the functionality can be considered a superset. Uh, that is also of interest to us. Uh, floating point atomics, uh, I think it's come up elsewhere before. I, we've seen that that many uh, machine learning kernels, uh, you know, uh, leverage floating point atomics quite extensively. Uh, this extension, generalized image from buffer, uh, is extremely interesting uh, because one of the things that we've seen is for machine learning on mobile, often, uh, it is uh, faster on many uh, mobile GPUs to use images uh, as opposed to buffers, uh, especially for reads. Uh, now, if you are doing, uh, uh, you know, if you're sort of doing inferencing of, of a big model and you have uh, several layers, one of the things you could do is to allocate a small pool of backing, large backing buffers, and then uh, effectively overlay an image onto those backing buffers. And as you work your way through the 
uh, layers of the model, you tend to reuse those backing buffers, and this helps keeps your uh, uh, memory footprint low. Uh, so this is one of the interesting techniques that we've seen used very often for, for machine learning on mobile. A uh, few of the other things uh, that are coming up that will also help are extended vectors. Those are vectors of size uh, 32 and uh, 64, which will have similar properties to the vectors that are already in OpenCLC. And then finally, uh, to help with synchronization, uh, semaphores. Uh, and uh, I've listed here all of the semaphore-related extensions uh, that are provisionally released by Kronos. Uh, those are also on our interest list in terms of uh, supporting going forward. Right? So uh, the summary here is that uh, machine learning is a rapidly growing area. It's helping to drive a lot of the uh, you know, features uh, uh, of, of OpenCL. And uh, from Qualcomm's point of view, we see this as extremely important and we're going to continue to invest in extensions and features uh, uh, for OpenCL that help advance uh, machine learning. Thank you. Thank you, Balaji. Qualcomm is doing some exciting work in machine learning with OpenCL, especially in the mobile space. So thank you, we appreciate your presentation. Next up is the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions, please submit them using the Q&A button in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Neil Trevet will be moderating this panel. Neil. Great, thank you, Jeff. And I invite um, everyone, all the panelists to turn on your cameras so we can, we can see you. Thank you both for awesome presentations and thank you to Kevin too from ARM to, um, for joining. Um, Kevin, you didn't get a chance to, to present. Do you want to just briefly introduce yourself before we, before we dive into the Q&A? Sure. Uh, hello, I'm Kevin. I work at ARM on GPU compute and uh, machine learning on Mali GPUs. Great. Thank you. No, it's good to have you all here. So we, we have we have a few questions coming in. The um, one that kind of follows on directly from your presentation, Balaji. So let's uh, let's start there whilst your slides are still fresh in our mind. So the you mentioned the the, the value of recordable cues for uh, machine learning acceleration a couple of times, know your own extensions, and then the the, the KHR uh, extension. The question is, you know, wh why does it significantly improve um, latency uh, and power? Can you can you expand on the, how why why cues are good, basically? Sure. So so let, let, let's take a machine learning model as an example, right? You, you typically have a hundred, say 100, 100, maybe even more, sometimes uh, 300 or 400 kernels incurred in sequence uh, in a, a uh, uh, they're all incurred in sequence back to back. Uh, uh, but let's say that you're actually streaming data through that model. Uh, the first consideration is you really are only going to be changing uh, one or two inputs uh, and maybe the output for the entire model. Uh, so even if you're streaming data through the model ping pong out of the uh, you know, hundreds of kernel arguments, hundreds of kernels, maybe thousands of kernel arguments, just one or two are going to change from one instance to another. Every single time you call NQ and range kernel, you're, you're giving the implementation a fair bit of work to do to figure out if anything changed and to go ahead and re reassemble the commands to send to the GPU. If you happen to record it and you only update the one or two arguments that changed, that's a whole lot less work for the implementation to do before it can uh, you know, confirm that the commands are, are ready to go to the GPU. So it really, uh, from, from the implementation's point of view, there's a lot less work to do if all of the commands have already been pre-processed and recorded. If you keep calling NQ and range kernel again, we have no idea if we've seen it before. So we have to do the processing all over again. So, so that's one big reason why you would save CPU power. Uh, the other interesting thing that happens is it, it, in terms of making sure that your GPU utilization is maximum, that you have no idle periods between dispatches when your CPU is busy assembling work for the GPU and the GPU actually has nothing to do. Um, the the recordable queue sort of helps with that because now you've assembled a huge chain of kernels that can be submitted in 
you know, sort of a single shot to the GPU. If you happen to have maybe these hundreds of kernels, some of them take a long time to run, some of them take a short time to run, it's actually going to be tough for you to figure out when is the optimal time, optimal size, uh, you know, to batch your work, when is the optimal time to flush, um, those can actually be tricky things to figure out from an application's point of view. So something like Corbel Q solves that problem for you and makes it pretty easy. Yeah, no, very cool. It's actually quite compelling. Anything, Roy or Kevin, you want to add to that? Yes, actually, recording queues and command buffers also give implementations greater latitude to sometimes reorder kernels and, and figure out a more optimal order for overall execution. Yeah, good point. Okay, so th th thank you, Roy, for your presentation. The uh, I, it was very, actually quite interesting, and I think there's some good learning lessons for uh, OpenCL from your experience. So I definitely appreciate uh, you, you sharing uh, your your experiences with us. The I mean, bottom line, I mean, it was it was interesting. The compile time seemed to be um one of the, the key issues you hit with with OpenCL I mean would you have any any uh, kind of high level ideas or um directions that uh, OpenCL should be thinking about to maybe fix some of those issues so for directions to fix that uh it's not really obvious it's just not a a simple problem to to some extent Part of this is an issue with our, our implementation where we are just generating too many kernels. We, we try and optimize for specific problems. And part of that is because you commonly rerun the, the same problems over and over again in machine learning workloads. But in, in our particular case, there are times where we generate problems that we honestly probably don't need to generate a new kernel for. And the other thing to go all along with this is it it's just variable. So allowing tools to to optimize this compilation performance would be would be helpful in some scenarios, but it's not it's not obvious where where that would would be belong. A lot of compiler infrastructure currently leverages LLVM for mm -hmm. for doing the the performance optimization and it would be a lot of work to to try and either use different infrastructure to to do this performance optimi optimization or a, a lot of work to make llvm compile faster i know that that is actually a a complaint a number of different groups have had that if you use llvm it doesn't run as as fast as people desire yeah making llvm run fast that sounds like a small trivial project <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah, it's interesting. The whole the whole subject of compiler infrastructure, now particularly as it relates to machine learning, is 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 a fascinating topic. Uh, any other any other comments on that, um, Kevin? I think you, you know you've been involved in that domain quite a lot. Yes, there are, there are I think there are a number of things we could discuss here. First, I'll, I'll acknowledge also that. Uh, Compilation time is a problem for, for a lot of implementations. And that's something we've seen as well. And it's a, a metric that is very sensitive to a lot of applications that make use of machine learning. A metric that's often cited is the time to first inference. Hmm. And application developers have, have got telemetry that shows that basically users abandon applications or loadable modules from their application if it doesn't compile fast enough. It doesn't start executing quickly enough. So that is a very important problem that uh, as a standard body, we, we have to solve really. Going back maybe to the improvements to OpenCL, we could consider to, to help with that. There's one thing that comes to mind, especially when seeing the, the nice improvements you got from using Spear V, and it's the use of a specialization constant at the OpenCLC level. This could potentially uh, enable libraries like one uh, DNN to reduce the number of kernels they generate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that is correct, and we we looked into it into using that for for our particular use case. We didn't find it being quite enough, 
performance improvement, but it definitely helped. Yeah, interesting. Galashi, anything you want to add, want to add on that? Uh, probably not so much from my side. Uh, obviously, for our use cases, you know, by and large, developers have shipped binaries. Um, so they do compile like the first time the application loads. Uh, uh, you know, if they ship source the first time the application loads, it'll compile it to binary and then cache it. And then from then on, it's creating the program from a binary. Uh, you know, for our extensions, we, we uh, use pre-compiled binaries. Uh, uh, so yeah, I don't have any, you know, solution to add beyond that, but, but certainly it would be interesting to, to find out if there's an extension that we could do that would help solve this problem. Right. So your solution is don't, don't use the compiler <laughs> at, at, at the critical time. I mean, <laughs> right. Yeah. right, right. And the annoying thing is that we often have to use it at least once, and even that one time is a problem. <laughs> right, right. So, so Kevin, I know, I, I, you know, we've talked before about um, is this something where like a multi-level solution, something like MLIR, would be able to help? Do you think it, does it solve help solve this problem or not? I don't think it helps solve the problem per se, but there are interesting parallels to draw between the techniques that Roy has uh, alluded to and uh, what MLIR has been designed to, to achieve really. Because if I followed your presentation correctly, Roy, you're, you're doing progressive lowering and transformations of your high level description for the model into lower and lower level representations for it and probably compiling down to assembly. I'm not sure if you said that explicitly. Yeah, that's that's correct. And it, 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 it's interesting to see that there's an emergence of more and more of, uh, of these frameworks. Haloid is not new, TVM is, is not new either, and leverage the same idea as, uh, as Haloid. It, so there might be lessons here to learn for, for OpenCL. And I, I will say there is actually another piece of information that, that can go along with this. For these optimization workloads, we are targeting very specific problems. Not all the optimization transforms we implemented are actually, say, logically correct. They aren't necessarily transformations that could be applied by a general framework because you may change the, the state of the problem, but for our use case, we know it, it doesn't. And so we're able to skip steps to generate the, the end result slightly faster. That's a very good point. Having looked into things like vectorization or unrolling of kernels for OpenCLC, there is quite a bit of analysis and implementation needs to perform to make sure that it's safe and legal to apply those transforms. Yeah. Yeah, no, very interesting. And I, you know, just a complete aside, I think MLIR is one of the, it's a very <laughs> confusing name. It, everyone thinks it's machine learning, <laughs> I, but it's, it's multi-level. So anyway, that's, uh, I've always been confused by that. So I have a question for uh, kind of Balaji, kind of following up on um, your, um, your your presentation. I mean, do, 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 you, do you have, a, could you, again, could you expand? I mean, well, what's the, um, how, do you, how would you compare and contrast um, acceleration at the graph level, you no, know, versus the meta commands that you know, the, the Qualcomm extension uses. Have, have you thought about that much? Because that's an, a kind of related and interesting topic. Sure. Uh, I, I think, you know, they both complement each other. And, and I'll sort of uh, circle back to, to uh, you know, what we've done with TVM, where we were able to, to fuse, uh, uh, you know, our, our uh, meta command extension with, with uh, uh, TBM's uh, BYOC. So what we think, uh, it, the way to look at it is there may be a few key meta commands where, uh, you know, the vendor is able to provide the highest acceleration. And, and for those meta commands, uh, use the, uh, uh, you know, vendor provided uh, extension. Uh, for everything else, uh, you could either use a, a uh, graph compiler all right, or you can write your own kernels. So, so the idea behind a meta command type extension is they would 
either be integrated into a library or into a backend. Uh, but, but fundamentally, it's not incompatible with the output of a graph compiler. Uh, so the idea is, you know, to have the best of both worlds, right? Uh, and uh, uh, you can have uh, fused meta commands as well. We support those in our extension. So uh, really, uh, whatever works best. Uh, in some cases, you may find that a, a compiler-generated uh, kernel works well, and that's great. Uh, you can use it. And and if not, if our meta command happens to work well because we understand our hardware well and we've managed to craft some uh, uh, special purpose kernel for that, uh, then then use our meta command. All right. So so we would sort of leave it with that and say you know want to make sure the developer has all the choices and they can mix and match and choose as they please. Yep. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and we're getting a number of kind of related questions on, on this uh, for, from the audience. I mean, the, um, see if we can kind of combine a few. So, I mean, it, the one question is is interesting. Uh, it, are there widely, it, it's, it's talking how we get integrated into frameworks. You know, uh, ben has asked the question, how should we um, um, enable OpenCL? To better integrate into popular machine learning frameworks, there's another question, same same kind of thing. Are there widely adopted tools to bring TensorFlow um, um, to use uh, OpenCL so we get OpenCL uh, integrated in, into TensorFlow and, and other frameworks? I mean, so so uh, is the kind of things you're talking about, Balaji? Do you think that is the best way? I mean, TVM. Interesting. Sure. It's going out to other frameworks too. So I, I guess it, the first answer is I think uh, TensorFlow Lite already has a OpenCL backend. And, and from my experience, that actually is a very well-written backend and runs really nicely. Um, so it's, it, especially on mobile, there, there actually are a number of open source frameworks already that use OpenCL. And uh, obviously, we'd, we'd love to hear from anyone who, who has uh, experience with writing an OpenCL backend if you know they have any challenges or feedback on that. But as far as I know, it already does the job pretty well. Uh, uh, so, so there's a lot of uh, you know frameworks out there, especially on mobile. Uh, might be a slightly different story on desktop. Uh, it, again, uh, my gut feeling is might be more a question of uh, you know someone actually signing up to, to uh, do an OpenCL backend and maintain it, as opposed to there being any inherent uh, technical reasons as to why it can't be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Roy or, or Kevin, any more thoughts on that? How do we get better integrated into frameworks? For for some cases, so from my perspective, I'm working on a library. So the, the main interface that we can care about is the frameworks interface with our, our library. Mm. So if we're trying to integrate OpenCL into an, just a, a general framework, one of the concerns that I would have is somewhat performance, right? A lot of machine learning workloads require a, a lot of compute to be, be performant. So if you're trying to integrate OpenCL, it's how do you get different vendors to contribute to that so that you can actually maintain performance with, say, this generic implementation? Or is this just a generic implementation that's supposed to be good enough and is just a fallback if there's no vendor supported support within say TensorFlow or the, the framework to actually try and accelerate for your hardware. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, Kevin? I was gonna bring a similar point actually and performance portability is a, is a problem but it's I think hindering open, the adoption of OpenCL in those framework or at least fragmenting its adoption in in some ways, it's very hard for a framework developer to write a unique set of kernels that perform reasonably well on a wide range of devices. And what we often see these days is vendors stepping in and creating their own libraries with their own optimizations, and then either trying or not trying to integrate them into the framework. And the picture today looks like a fairly rich, not to say complex, web of uh, interconnected software projects. Right. And and I think the difficulties with performance portability play a role here. Yeah, I actually agree with that. I mean, actually preparing that short intro slide deck 
now I actually counted up now close to 20 different frameworks. So they're all using OpenCL, but you know, why, why are we doing this 20 times? <laughs> there, uh, maybe we, we are maybe overdue for some kind of consolidation, but it's interesting the kind of role that OpenCL could play in that. I mean, and to just perhaps to close this question, I mean, there is a specific question for you, Banaji, the, you know, um, in the list there, it, is there a significant performance benefit from writing custom, a custom ML app with, the Qualcomm ML Ops compared to just using TVM or TensorFlow Lite. I mean, what is your on the ground experience, which is you get more benefit one way or the other? Uh, yeah, uh, so I think there is a, a clear benefit to using our extension. Uh, again, uh, that is the, the extent to which we'll benefit will uh, differ depending upon how much effort uh, you know, a given developer puts into writing his own kernel and optimizing it for our Arduino GPUs. Uh, but what we've seen is that consistently we deliver a clear benefit for certain key operators like convolution. Hmm. Um, so that is where the, uh, you know, extent of uh, performance advantage is max. And, and we do expect to be able to offer value, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of accelerating those key operators going forward as well. Um, so yeah, uh, the answer is yes, there is a benefit. Um, some of the frameworks have actually written very well optimized kernels for our GPUs. Uh, and, and so the relative benefit comes down, uh, but it's still there. Yep, interesting. There was one other uh, question that actually I answered. I can perhaps I'll just um, briefly summarize. Um, an interesting question and something near and dear to my heart is well, why did kernels release uh, NNEF? A new, a new format for uh, trained neural networks. Uh, it stands for neural, neural Network Exchange Format, as opposed to supporting other formats that have already been developed like Onyx or Apache uh, TVM. It's a great question. Um, and the, the, the answer is uh, we need uh, stability. So some of our APIs like OpenVX um, import NNEF directly. There's actually API calls in OpenVX to just pick up a trained network in an NEF format and just uh, import it and start uh, uh, inferencing on it directly, which, which is, you know, OpenVX is a high, higher level abstraction API. So that kind of uh, functionality is, is very convenient. And to do that reference from an API to a spec, the spec needs to be stable, um, else um, the, the spec becomes meaningless. And Onyx is an awesome format um, that, it, you know, obviously it's widely used but its its main customer base is the software community, and you know, so Onyx's strength is that it it adapts very quickly to to new methods and you know, all the research that's going on. But that makes it um, not suited to being a hardware interface spec. So uh, NNEF fulfills that role, and then Kronos releases open source translators from Onyx and other formats into uh, NNEF. Uh, so NNEF is our point of uh, stability. The open source translators uh, that do have to track Onyx and other formats as they evolve is a much better place, much more flexible and agile place to make those tracking changes than trying to constantly update um, the specification. And the uh, it's not a, a perfect analogy, but there is an analogy to Spear and Spear V. Uh, Spear was essentially LLVM IR, which we tried to use as a format to bring into OpenCL, and it kept moving and it kept breaking us. Uh, so we had to invent Spear V, and I think that you know, the, there's somewhat of an, an, an analogy, an analogy there. So a kind of interesting uh, learning uh, experience. And and final point was. Um, NNEF was actually before Onyx, so we didn't refuse to do Onyx, they refused to do NNEF, <laughs> historical footnote. Um, so we're almost out of time, perhaps just, um, I think we've answered most of the questions there, perhaps let's finish up with a high level question to, to everyone um, in, in the panel. Um, what, what are the application domains that you, you, you're finding are driving the uh, end user demand for uh, machine learning uh, acceleration. You know, is it photography? What, what kind of what kind of domains are, are you seeing being the main drivers for, for all of this? So maybe um, Balaji, do you want to start? Yeah. Uh, again, we don't have the full view because uh, you know many of our customers will, will, will tell us that 
you know, they have these specific needs for machine learning acceleration, but they won't exactly tell us what they're doing with it. Uh, but to the extent, I think we can determine uh, image processing is is probably the the dominant, uh, you know, in various forms, image segmentation and so on. Uh, I think that that is the uh, dominant uh, uh, use case area. Mm -hmm. And Kevin, Any, anything? Yeah, I tend to I, I tend to agree. That's a very generic label. Maybe under image processing, there are lots of di different things and. Uh, Computational photography would be one, ranging from the simple, you know, just background blurring or, or things like that, that these days can be done with machine learning to your bunny ears in your teenage, <laughs> your teenager's favorite messaging application. Yep. In more embedded also use cases, I think there's a wider range of, uh, of those as well, but trying to think of, a, of good examples and it's not coming. So I'll, I'll probably hand over to Roy for <laughs> his thoughts. Sure. So for my thoughts, I I actually have a somewhat limited view because I'm working on implementing the, the optimizations and there are other people fielding the questions of exactly what to we should be optimizing for. Hmm. But one thing that I see, and this is almost surely biased by the fact that I'm getting this request because we perform poorly on some workload. And a lot of that ends up being actually like research related. So people will be researching some application and then they will maybe try slightly different say topologies, combinations of things, and then are looking to then scale up based on the, the results of that. And then we, we receive requests because we, we have optimized things, but they managed to hit some edge case that actually were poorly optimized on. Right. So you're, you're the bleeding edge then. <laughs> cool. An right. Another one class yeah. of use cases that we often see actually these days is natural language processing as well. Yeah. There, there are more and more use cases, especially on mobile platforms. Yeah. I, I think there's all forms of net, no, advanced user interface that are going to use machine learning. I think that's a huge, going to be a huge growth area. And speech is definitely one of them. All right. Any other last comments? All right. So we're, we're at the top of the hour. So I really want to thank all, all of the panelists and uh, for coming on and helping uh, answer the questions. So I hope that was uh, interesting for everyone here. So. Uh, thanks again, and thanks to the audience for coming. Um, back to you, Jeff. Yes, thank you for joining. As a reminder, please take a moment to fill out the survey that pops up in your feedback. It's important to help us prove these presentations. And please let us know if there are any other Chronos related topics you may be interested in. And thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the webinar and have a great day.